Amor Motley delivers a budget intended to foster economic and social development. Barbados hosting the ICC T20 World Cup could provide unprecedented global exposure. Help underway for Spa Hill St. Joseph experiencing road woes. And in sports, Combermere boys and girls take the early BSAC leads after day one. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. Good evening, I'm Pearson Bowen. Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley today presented her government's 2024 budget, outlining the strategies to boost the economy and to spur growth. For more than four hours in a wide-ranging address, she touched on a number of measures. Sharika Griffith joins us now with details. Sharika? Yes, Pearson. The Prime Minister touched on several areas of economic, financial and social development as she delivered the budget. Well, before we hear from her directly, here's a snapshot at some of the measures outlined. No new taxes in this year's budget. However, there will be adjustments to some rates. The debt is less now than 2018 and government is committed to taking it even lower. There are new measures to speed up real estate transactions. The effort includes a quicker mortgage process. A review of the minimum wage is on the cards. We will see some possible increases there. And there will be a focus on renewable energy, efforts to unlock the investments in that sector. As you know, Pearson, one of the most important questions around budget time is whether or not there will be new taxes. Well, the Prime Minister dealt with that up front. In order to put you into a listening mood, let me say as early as I did last year, there will be no new taxes. But I am telling you up front, that I will warn you that there will be some adjustments during the course of this year of a few rates that we will need the public to be able to bear if our services that depend on those rates are to keep up with the kind of service that Barbadians want. Well, Prime Minister Motley has also addressed concerns about the national debt as she gave the assurance that it is still at a manageable level. She said in 2018, when her government came into office, the debt stood at 178.9% of GDP. But as of the end of last month, it has been reduced to 114.6% of GDP. According to Ms. Motley, this is despite the COVID-19 pandemic and extreme weather events, including a hurricane and the ash fall. You know where the debt is today, sir? 14.9 billion. In almost six years, we have only increased the debt of this country by 2 billion in spite of going through all of the challenges that I just spoke to you that are challenges that this country did not face in 65 years and 100 years. Mr. Speaker, these are the facts. And I want to remind you, sir, that this government remains fixed on our determination to reduce our debt down to 60%, and we hope to be able to do so by 2035, or if we negotiate with our international partners, by a soon date thereafter. Prime Minister Motley says despite the challenges, the country is on target to see its 12th consecutive quarter of growth. Unemployment is about 8 percent, which is below the historical average of 10.3 percent. Meanwhile, the country's reserves stand at $3.2 billion, or about 33 weeks of import cover. Well, Prime Minister Motley also wants to see mortgage and land transactions moving at a faster pace. She says government will be reviewing all of the systems and processes related to transactions involving real estate and will establish recommendations to speed up the process. In the meantime, though, sir, we are setting the standard and sending the signal. And government starts this ball rolling today. One of the main delays in any land transaction is the investigation of title. This is required because except for lands in registered areas, title to land is not guaranteed. We have set a target of 10,000 housing solutions, sir, over the next few years. And these will be largely done on lands owned by the state. To bring greater certainty to title and to relieve attorneys of long and complex title searches of state lands, we will shortly be amending the Crown Lands Vesting and Disposal Act 
to provide that all lands transferred from the state shall have an indefeasible title. Ms. Motley would also like to see the banking sector investing some of its liquidity in government bonds to help build the economy. She spoke of meeting last Friday with the sector and is satisfied that government and banks can be on the same page. The financing of government's operations is an opportunity for financial institutions to expand, expand sorry, their balance sheet, to generate income and to support Barbados's future development. The banking sector is currently characterized by very high levels of excess liquidity that can be invested in private investment and in government debt instruments with limited risk. The boss bonds have offered a favorable rate of return and the government is making a measured return to the Treasury bill market and seeking to redevelop our yield curve over time. And after the introduction of a national minimum wage three years ago, the Prime Minister says it will be reviewed by the Minimum Wage Board. She says inflation is rising and the rates for those at the bottom need to be addressed. It will be required to review the rate which currently stands at $8.50 per hour and then of course $9.25 per hour for security officers. Given the rise in inflation, there is no doubt that there will be some adjustment. However, in order to protect those persons at the bottom of the play scale, I am proposing that going forward, we will index the minimum wage, thereby making provision for an annual increase in accordance with inflation, but with a full review every five years to be done to ensure whether the adjustment needs to be more than inflation. With Barbados facing a challenge with a storage of electricity from renewable energy, the Prime Minister says there will be a new process for the procurement of storage facilities. She says Barbados wants to meet the target of 650 megawatts and the grid can only take another 100. However, she's not going to allow the country's national energy security to be threatened. This is mission number one in being able to achieve mission number one which is to be able to have a sustainable and resilient Barbados in the face of a climate crisis. It's against this backdrop, sir, that I announce that my government will immediately begin a process of engaging in direct negotiation as its preferred form of procurement with international suppliers of storage systems to determine what will be available and most affordable for those investors who want to participate in storage in Barbados. During the coming weeks, during the coming weeks, there will be an advertisement that will seek to invite interested parties in this nation to pre-qualify for participation in the provision of battery storage through direct negotiation so that our first licenses for storage can be issued in this year. The Pearson government has also announced a new billion-dollar climate investment plan that will, among other things, aim to create thousands of new jobs. Prime Minister Motley outlined the key targets of the Barbados National Resilience Plan, which runs up to 2035. It includes the expansion of the deep water port, positioning Barbados as a transshipment hub, future-proofing essential systems such as water and roads, as well as comprehensive investments in a dozen priority areas. We aim, sir, between now and 2035, as a result of this plan alone, to be able to generate 10,000 new quality jobs and to achieve a 50% reduction in the poverty rate in this country, ensuring that 100% of the population also has access to primary and secondary health care, and that we can, as I said earlier, attain 100% renewable energy generation. To do this, to execute all of this will require a total investment of 14.5 billion US dollars by 2035, or to put it more clearly, just short of 30 billion Barbados dollars. Well, the Prime Minister says about 17 billion of this sum is to be sourced from the private sector. The remainder, she says, will have to come from the public sector, given that it relates to social goods. 1.9 billion Barbados, sorry comprising of 100 million U.S., 200 million Barbados, from government revenue resulting from business as usual GDP growth, 
and another 850 million US or 1.7 billion Barbados generated through additional GDP growth spurred by the successful implementation of the implementation plan. We have already started with one debt swap. We broke new ground globally with the debt swap for nature, what we call the blue bonds, and we are now looking at a debt swap for climate in order to allow us to secure more cheaper and longer term public financing from domestic and international lenders, which we are championing through the Bridgetown Initiative and which will be a critical part of the portion of this financing. We also heard that modern transfer pricing legislation will soon be introduced to Parliament. The Prime Minister says tax treaties will be revised and extended to take advantage of the country's tax reform and to make the destination more attractive to foreign investors. The locals will also like the fact that we will amend the Economic Substance Act to reduce the onerous reporting obligations, most of which are no longer necessary as we have modernized our tax system. And most importantly, we have addressed all 53 matters that we found languishing on assuming office that Barbados had been put on a blacklist, then gray list. And there will be a full analysis of the budget tomorrow from 9 a.m. to 12 noon on CBC TV 8 and 100.7 QFM. Well, Pearson, that's a look at some of the measures announced today by the Prime Minister during her budget presentation. Thank you so much, Sharika. We'll, well, prior to the delivery of the budget, supporters gathered outside of Parliament to greet the MPs in what has become a tradition. They were given a high-energy welcome as they made their way into the chamber. Onlookers said it brought back memories of a bygone era, when the Parliament Yard was the preferred place to be on Budget Day. Trevor Thorpe reports. Prime Minister Mia Amor received the bouquet as she made her way to the House of Assembly this afternoon. She was greeted by several Barbadians, including supporters and members of her constituency, before proceeding to the Inner Chamber of Parliament. Crowds were also on hand to welcome several other parliamentarians, including MP for St. Lucy Peter Phillips, as well as St. Michael's South Central MP Marsha Cattle and St. Michael's South Representative Kirk Humphrey. Deputy Prime Minister Santia Bradshaw also assembled outside Parliament with colleagues that included Speaker Arthur Holder, Neil Rowe, Edmund Hickson, Sandra Husbands, Davidson Ishmael, Trevor Prescott and Corey Lane. Several supporters travelled from the East to welcome St. Philip South MP and Minister of Agriculture, Food and Nutritional Security in Darwin. Also captured making an entrance was Opposition Leader Ralph Thorne. Members of the Upper House were also represented. Trevor Thorpe, CBC News. We take a break here, but coming up, hosting the T20 World Cup could put a spotlight on Barbados like never before. Barbados hosting of the ICC T20 World Cup will provide a level of global exposure the island is unable to buy. The assertion from Chairman of the Local Organizing Committee, Ambassador Noah Lynch, who was speaking last evening on the people's business. He says the fact that Barbados is the home base for some of the top teams also augurs well in terms of spin-off benefits. When you have England and Australia and Scotland in our backyard, at least in the preliminary rounds. And they're going to be here from, as I said, from the second, 1st of June, they're coming a little bit before, and the final is on the 29th of June. So just imagine any of these countries getting through to the final. Imagine what's going to happen. They're going to be in Barbados for over 30 days. That gives us an opportunity to throw out the red carpet. But in addition to that, for us to be able to show off and showcase what Barbados really is about, which is going to bode well for the future of Barbados in terms of tourism and hospitality, but also investment opportunities and the like. The Barbados Tourism Marketing Incorporated is also playing its part, according to Manager for Sports Kamal Springer. He says the BTMI is working with 18 tour operators from across the world to get the message out and the tourists in. So we are working really hard to make sure that our marketing plan is right. We want to make sure that people know that we can come here for cricket, but there's a lot more you can come here for. So Cricket Plus, you can come for food, you can come for beach, you can come for the culture, the entertainment. So we're doing our best to make sure that it's vibrant through the markets. All of our overseas markets are working really hard to make sure that the diaspora from Barbados are aware of what's going on in Barbados. 
and then work with various consulates to make sure that their various diasporas are aware as well. So we are working really hard to make sure that the messaging is getting out there and preparing ourselves uh, for the influx that we expect to come, come June. The hop is on the way for residents of Spa Hill St. Joseph experiencing road woes owing to land slippage issues. Attorney General Dale Marshall, who is also a member of Parliament for St. Joseph, says plans are on the way to fix the road used to access the close-knit rural community. It is an issue of being of balancing costs to benefit. Um, I maintain, though, that we have an obligation to fix those roads rather than taking the easy route of asking people to move out. Uh, my constant refrain is that when people, when you move, when the government moves people out of communities because of challenges with the roads, those communities die. And uh, for me, in a rural constituency like St. Joseph, it's important for us to maintain those arteries, no matter how difficult. The situation in this part has gotten worse since the year turned. Obviously, we've had a lot of rains and so on to deal with. Um, I've had discussions with the engineers, and the intention is to reopen that road fully. It is, in fact, part of the uh, compliant program with the Chinese. So that road is to be reopened fully. But in the meantime, uh, Public Works has said that they will open up the road from the St. Andrew side and open it up. Um, and, and do a better job from the St. Joseph site so people will at least have possible access. Technology and innovation will be a major focus of the new industrial policy. This announcement from Minister of Industry, Innovation, Science and Technology, Marcia Cadell, as she addressed the Barbados Labour Party's Christchurch West and St. Michael's South Central Community Meeting last evening. The minister explained that the government is focusing on the creation of high-skilled jobs with high pay to ease cost-of-living pressures in Barbados. Minister Cadell also provided an update on the recently established Mechanics Bay at Grisette St. Michael, which has a high uptake by business owners. That meant that we, not, we are now oversubscribed. The Mechanics Bay is full. We are, build, we are building five more units currently. And we're looking for more space because mechanics from around Barbados have said, look, what we're finding is that some of our clients prefer the safety of the mechanics bay, where they go and they leave their vehicle and they know that nobody ain't picking up and driving it off the lot the next night. And so we are now oversubscribed and we thank Barbadians, really, for understanding that this is a collective challenge we had and that we're solving it collectively. Minister Cattle further revealed plans for the Pelican Village Centre, which will include the provision of child and elderly care services. She explained that these new services at Pelican Village will allow for more Barbadians to work while their relatives are cared for. For the first time in a long time, having new daycare and elderly care facilities at Pelican Village to accommodate 150 children and 50 older people, because it's not just childcare that we need. A lot of us have our older relatives living with us and we can't go and work because they need constant care. And so this is one of the ways in which the Ministry of Industry uh, is not just concerned with making companies profitable and driving growth in that way, but making sure that everybody can participate in that growth. The Ministry of Youth is moving to make the second batch of its Project Protégé mentorship program bigger and better this year. Minister Charles Griffith made the revelation at the Mix and Mingle for the first cohort of the program over the weekend. Yes, what government will do is to peer a parenting program to this particular Protégé project because I believe that there's a nexus and we need to fuse the two programs together if we're going to maximize what is happening within the program. It can't be a situation where the mentors are bringing about change and then when the mentees return home that all of the hard work that was done is being eroded. So one of the things that we will do is to bring that particular program and fuse the two together so that we can have maximum impact in terms of the lives of our young people. While making an appeal for mentors to come forward for the next version, Minister Griffith notes the program offers numerous benefits for participants. There's a need for mentors to mentor a number of young persons in this country. And those of you who are mentees, I know for a fact that you have been impacted over the last year by having those mentors in your life 
if only to be a sounding board at some point in time where you pick up the phone and you just want to talk and you have a voice at the other end that shows empathy and able to listen to you and offer you quality advice. And I'm sure that if you follow what was, in, what was delivered to you by these mentors, that your life will change. The police are probing a fatal collision along the East Coast Road in St. Andrew, which resulted in the death of a man. According to lawmen, that accident occurred around 14 minutes after 4 this afternoon and resulted in the driver of the vehicle being killed on the spot. Police say the car collided with a utility pole, which was uprooted and shattered, and with live electrical wires were strewn across the road, making that scene dangerous. The man, whose identity was not disclosed by the officers up until news time, was the sole occupant of the car. Crowds gathered at every vantage point to get a glimpse of the wreckage. In addition to the police, the Barbados Fire Service and Ambulance Service responded to the scene. Personnel from the Barbados Light and Power Company were also summoned to remove the wires and restore electrical power to the area. Sports Night is brought to you by Power A. Pause is power. And by Dasani. Live first, Dasani after. In Sports Night tonight, the man with all the action is Damien Best. Damien. Yeah, good evening to you, Pierce. Good evening to our viewers and listeners. Indeed, have all the action for you. Come on, Mayor, maintain their grip on the 2024 Dasani Power 8 sat after day one of the semifinals at the Usain Bolt Sports Complex. The Waterford-based athletes lead both the boys' and girls' sections following the start of the track events today. The top five in the boys are Common Mayor 109, uh, Queen's College 78, Harrison College 70, the St. Michael's School 50, and Christchurch Foundation on 49 points. In the girls, the top five are Common Mayor 89 points, the St. Michael's School 82, the Allen School 80, Harrison College 67, and Princess Margaret 31. CBC's Amar Goddard Boyce reports on some of the day's finals. The first athletes to christen the brand new Ryan Braffitt track were the competitors in the grueling open girls 3000 meter. It was also the first final of the day and from the get go this was a ding dong battle between arch rivals Lucia Wilkinson of Princess Margaret and Layla McIntyre of Harrison College. Seven and a half laps came down to this. The final 400 meters where Wilkinson warmed up for the Carifta Games with an impressive victory in 11 minutes, 16.06 .06 seconds to Edge McIntyre's 11 minutes, 22.29 and Commomere's Taryn Sutherland in third, 12 minutes, 56.66. .66. The boys' 5,000 meter followed and the contest was between Luke McIntyre of Harrison College, Nathan Nurse of Princess Margaret and Courage and Paris Stephen Altman and when all was said and done, it was McIntyre who cruised home way ahead of the field. 17 minutes, 26.97. Nurse was second, 18 minutes, 34.74. And Altman third, 20 minutes, 48.36. The BSA action continues tomorrow with another track final. The Junior Boys 3000 meters. And Mark Goodridge Boys, CBC Sports. Thanks, Amar. Well, tickets for this year's Shafet Frosty's knapsack track events are reportedly in high demand. Assistant Chairman Janelle Denny made the disclosure to CBC Sports during a recent interview. Denny says there is increased interest surrounding the highly anticipated primary school's athletic meet set for the Usain Bolt Sports Complex. We have been getting lots of requests from the schools in terms of trying to find out what is the quota as it relates to the schools and how much they can bring. We've, we always make sure that we make them um, comfortable and uh, make sure that they have access as well in addition to the general public. But for the public, we, we expect that persons will come out and support the children. You can appreciate having two zones on each day. The tickets will be hot in terms of trying to get those tickets and, and trying to gain entry. But obviously, we know that Usain Bolt is limited in its capacity. So we always provide the streaming for our clientele. Well, the Knapsack Track Competition runs from March 25th to 28th, and the finals will be April 3rd at the Usain Bolt Sports Complex.
Well, with the recent completion of the relaying of the Ryan Braffitt track at that Usain Boat Sports Complex, the onus is now on the UWI to ensure that it is maintained. Dr. Rudolph Allen says systems are in place for persons to be trained in its upkeep. Before the, the two experts who are on the track, before they leave, they're going to be training our staff in terms of maintenance of the track. Um, and we are going to do regular maintenance at least twice, uh, three times a year. Um, so we're going to make sure that this new track is well maintained. Uh, they said to us that if it's well maintained, we should get 10 to 15 years out of it. Um, so we're hoping to get that. Well, there are a few more areas that will be in need of upgrade at the complex, the stands in particular, and that will be addressed in future plans. We're looking at uh, providing some overhead. Uh, we're looking into the possibility of doing solar too as well. Um, so there's some future plans. Of course, everything takes money. Uh, so we're, we're trying to see how we can fund that in terms of having the overhead coverage and some solar too as well. And indeed, the track will also be available for athletes to train. Well, only one Barbadian has made it safely through the first two rounds so far at the BTMI Barbados Surf Pro presented by Diamonds International. The action got going today with the men's section at the Soup Bowl in Bathsheba. Barbadian Lewis St. John was impressive with a 12.13 for second place in Heat 2 to advance to the round of 64. Reed Plantis of Canada won the Heat with a 12.77. Here we go, Green up and right in Louis St. John from Barbados. What's he going to do? Throws up the first turn, smashes it out the back, cutting it back, cutting back on the open face. The big opening outside maneuver for Louis St. John. Let me tell you, he has got to be probably the best backside. Here, here we go on the replay. Coming off the bottom on a bigger size wave, wow. smashes it. Comes down back to the power pocket, looking for more. Does another snap, ending the wave right there at the end where it just fades out. Well, Axe Garrett, Warren Povey, Rafi Gooding, and Che Allen were among those eliminated, unfortunately. The event continues tomorrow with the Barbadians, Ocean Gittins, Tommaso Layson, and Caleb Rapson first in the water. The Business Report is brought to you with the kind compliments of the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. In tonight's Business Report, mobile phone users will benefit from increased legislative project protection come April the 1st. That is when Phase 3 of the Mobile Telecommunications Code 2023 will come into effect. Director of Consumer Protection at the Fair Trading Commission, Deva Leslie Ward, has been explaining what it means for consumers. She says, given the increasing number of, and the use of artificial intelligence to push advertising on cell phones, the code tries to ensure AI is used in a fair and reasonable and responsible manner. We're going to be making sure that the consumers are well protected at every single aspect of that customer journey from, from the beginning where you see your first advertisement that encourages you to come in. The code covers that right up until you purchase and even after you purchase. So some of the changes that you will see, for example, there are no required data notifications. So once you reach 50% of your usage, 75% and 100%, the providers have agreed to notify the consumers to let them know they've reached their limit. Now, if the provider does not issue those notifications, they have to charge the consumer at the in-plan rate. Another new obligation imposed on telecoms providers relates to the reality that consumers often do not read their contracts. What the FTC and um, the other stakeholders as well as the service providers have agreed is that there's now going to be a document called the Summary of Important Information. And that document is going to set out in a snapshot a one-page agreement which contains the main terms and conditions that will bind consumers. So for example, it will give you an example of how many minutes, how much data you have, the, the charge for your in-plan rate, the charge for the out-of-plan rate, and any contract terms that might be detrimental to you will also be included. So you can really have a good understanding as to whether or not the plan will really suit your needs. 
A new digital way for doing business has been unveiled in Barbados. CIBC Caribbean and MasterCard have partnered to launch the MasterCard prepaid card. CIBC Caribbean's Director, Enterprise Payments, Cards and Merchant Services, Jennifer Fuller, said the card is a part of the bank's digital transformation journey. She said the primary objective is accelerating the cessation of checks, which was frequently used by government, corporate and business clients. This innovative offering is reflective of the bank's commitment to delivering convenient, easy, and secure digital banking solutions, while of course fostering financial inclusion. And with the prepaid card, our clients will also benefit from a card that is equipped with contactless payment capability and the chip and pin feature to provide stronger security, better fraud protection, and worldwide acceptance. Our technological advancement in payments means our clients, our cardholders, and our merchants can make and receive payments in a safe, secure, and simple manner, placing power and convenience in their hands. Back with more sports and back to Damien Best. Thanks so much, Pierre Simba. Ronald Suki King was in fine form as he won the inaugural Henderson Lane Elite Drafts Tournament last night. Pin in the ninth and final round at the Draft Center in Best Road, Christchurch. King topped the standings with 24 points. His arch rival Jack Francis settled for a second with 22. And the consistent Jeffrey Sox Clark third with 20 points, the same as Raul Williams. King dispatched Ryan Eustace with a win and a draw, while Francis drew both matches against Darwin Lord. Likewise, Clark was held to a draw by Trevor Howell, while Williams had a win and a draw against Michael Barker. Tournament director Mike Edgefield said he was impressed with the standard of play by the top players. During the tournament, there were two players who did not lose a match. Those two players were John Francis and Ron Sweeney. So that in itself should tell you very something. Another important statistic is that Mr. Francis was the only player in the tournament who did not lose a game. Yeah, congratulations to both. Some football news now. Paradise Thrash, Barbados Soccer Academy, while Deacons and Ellerton played to a draw when the 2024 BFA Premier League continued at friendship last night. CBC's Anne Margaret Boyce reports. Paradise in blue and yellow up against Barbados Soccer Academy. 20 minutes into the contest, the Dover Base boys on the attack down the flank, cross into the box. And a half-hearted clearance drops to Jomo Harris, who slaps it home and punches the air. Paradise 1, Soccer Academy 0. Just before the halftime whistle, Paradise double their advantage with this strike. The free kick from Armando Lashley is deflected into the bars. Paradise got a third, compliments another strike from Lashley before Barbados Soccer Academy got on the score sheet. A bit of a scramble in front of the goal mouth and BSA were on the board thanks to Ulrich Gill. But Paradise snatched a four for good measure when Okizi Lidedi scored in the 81st minute and that's how it ended. Paradise four, Soccer Academy one. The next fixture featured Deacons in red taking on Ellerton. Lovely pass from Shaquan Collimore into Rashad Jules who leaves it for Anson Barrow to touch home 1-0. To Ellerton. Midway through the second half, Deacons were awarded a set piece opportunity floated in by Nico Blackman, and the last touch is by Keon Atkins, and that's the final score. Ellerton won, Deacons won, and Mark Goodridge Boys, CBC Sports. Well, three of the four playoff spots for the Co-Operators General Insurance BABA Premier League are virtually filled, so the battle is on for the fourth and final berth. With some teams only having three games remaining in the regular season and some four, Fusion Boutique Station Hill Cavaliers lead on 21 points. Pylons, who have a game in hand, are on 20, while Burger King Clapham Bulls are third on 17. The only ones eliminated from the playoff contention are ANC Security Services Spartans, who are winless after 11 matches. And in two recent matchups at the Willy Gym, as a team's jockey for positions, Bulls defeated Lakers, while Cavs made light work of Spartans. Double header at the Wildy Gym. Let's start with Station Hill Cavaliers versus Spartans in black. Little Euro step in the lane from Devron Knight. Nicely done. 
The Cavs blew the Spartans out of the water after just one period, leading 33 to 14. Adriel Bathwick arriving at the cup and challenge, pouring 18 points. Limited production for the Spartans in the first half overall, but this was pleasant. Kadian Bathwick, teardrop in the lane, had a double double, 28 points, 13 boards. Only two other players achieved double figures for Spartans in this one. John Paul Aline with 20 and Sean Harden 11. But what the Spartans really needed was a miracle heading into the break. Down 35 to 62. The Cavs at a virtual practice session. The third quarter was a blur. So let's head to the fourth. Excellent block. Leads to the Gavin Phillips flush at the opposite end. 20 points for GP. The scoreboard told the story 103 to 60 in favor of the Cavs. Five minutes left. In fact, let's just end it here. Cavs blown away, a tired looking Spartans. 118 to 73. Second game, much more competitive. Lakers Sports Club in yellow versus Capon Bulls. Sharing is caring. Scott Wharton, that's a three. 18 points to his credit. Can't keep Akeem Marsh off the score sheet this season. The assist, though, finds Kimar Ben Bucket and the fall. Ben red hot in 2024. Team high 26 points and 10 rebounds. Bulls actually had the slight one point advantage heading into the break 41 to 40. Let's go second half now. First out of the gates, LSC, Keith Burkett Sharp. The Bulls, though, reapplying the pressure, especially. On the offensive board, Ben with another three-point play opportunity. The Clapham boys by seven with one quarter to go. Raheem Gibbons finds his spot, two of his 18. LSC did manage to close the gap to just three points in the fourth. But the question remained, could they overtake? Jehu Lafuel, game-high 34 points, 15 rebounds as well. There were eight lead changes in this contest. Lakers on the charge. But just when it looked like the tide had changed, Bulls go on a run. Simeon Maynard, yes sir, 19 points, made two of seven from deep. Then Ben says two can play that game unattended as Maynard draws a crowd, a dagger. The Bulls going on to get the win in the end over the Lakers, 87 to 79. That's our time tonight. Thank you for spending it with us. I'm Pearson Boeing. For the crew, to all of you, good night by God's will. We'll see you tomorrow.